Hello, hello. All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the deep learning lecture. From my side, uh, nice to see some familiar faces. I think some of you already. <laughs> the microphone again. This time I didn't hear it. Right, it's good to see some familiar faces actually from last week. Can I just make a poll? Who was actually participating in the machine learning fundamentals? Just to check. Okay. And the others are all very sound in statistical learning theory and no one in regularization, validation? Almost. Okay. Right. I try to keep the technical details in this deep learning lecture, let's say, to a, to a moderate degree. Um, still, I would recommend for those that really don't know exactly what validation is, what regularization is, um, how basically the number of samples relate to our learning capability, which is you know statistical learning theory, uh, not shared natives inequalities. Uh, this should be a little bit reviewed uh, from the machine learning tutorial that we had here last week, right? Because um, not today necessarily, but tomorrow morning. We will look at some of the regularizers in deep learning, and for this, you really need that knowledge. And also today, if it's a little bit related to overfitting neural networks, um, you need to make the connections to the theory. Right? I think sometimes it's cumbersome, um, but on the other hand, it gives us a solid ground to understand why sometimes this learning could be difficult, or why it actually can be improved as regularizers, and so forth. All right, so um, but let's not wait longer, let's dive into the material of today, which is largely around deep learning. And actually, to do deep learning in a very efficient way, we use GPGPUs. So, who of you has worked with deep learning before? Convolutional neural network, LSTM cells. Okay, that's not many. Artificial neural networks, let's say typical feed forward, back propagation. Okay, and who of you has uh, used GPGPUs or GPUs for short? Okay, also not many. Well, we improve that today and tomorrow. Right, so let's go a little bit maybe before we um, look what's in this lecture alone here today. Let us a little bit look on the outline of the course as a whole. Right, so and I would like to start with some of the deep learning fundamentals. So what is feature learning? What means actually the name deep? In learning and have some fundamentals covered, and then also perhaps a little bit of fundamentals in terms of uh, GPGPU. So, what is a graphical processing unit? Uh, why is this suddenly used for general purpose and not anymore for graphics? And so forth. However, you will notice we try to get you very early on board on the clusters here. So, we have a supercomputing center on board here, and of course, the idea is that you yourself do neural network models that you do deep learning models, which means we will here and there not only have theoretical lectures on dive really in exercises, starting from really, let's say, very simple neural networks, P4, uh, to much more sophisticated convolutional neural networks than uh, in the remaining of the today's lecture. So we have lecture one, two, three today, four, five, six tomorrow. And as you see, today we really then dive into the topic of convolutional neural networks, once we have settled the ground of deep learning is in general. So we will look a little bit on image processing. So the convolutional neural networks are particularly well suited for image processing. And in this context, we will have some of the tools explored. So what is TensorFlow? Roughly what types of tools we use in order to use TensorFlow? Because we use mostly Keras, which is an on-top layer, so to speak, on TensorFlow. And I will introduce you to the tools step by step. And of course, there are lots of different configuration options that you will see from the beginning. So there will be questions like, uh, why we use stochastic gradient descent as an optimizer and not Allen, which is supposed to be the default today. The reason is that we have to create this material step by step. And then also tomorrow we'll look in much more of the challenges and then we have lots of configuration options that we explore. But let us say we really start from the beginning here with neural networks. That's why a little bit we use uh, stochastic gradient descent and then other rather towards the end of the day. These words here and there mean not anything to you, but for some of you, you have already heard from that. Um, please wait basically until we have the kind of ground covered in order to answer questions like, for instance, new optimizers and so forth. So this will come, especially in, in kind of emphasis in this course is applications. 
right? So here and there we leave out the mathematical detail, or I point to my lecture last week, for instance, which was much more theoretical, and we use here the cluster. We will firstly start with some CPUs here in Ghent, and then we get uh, GPUs in Leuven to use, and also this needs to be done step by step. One word of warning before, the number of GPUs is limited, so please, before you submit the jobs to the GPUs, um, take step by step as we decide, and if you're unsure, raise your hand. We have people here that help, uh, three or two people that help and can actually then check if it's really everything all right with the GPU. This is especially useful if we look on the bigger applications, right? We already downsampled significantly in order to get this tutorial is going, but of course we want to also then uh, get this in practice, and when you all submit again and again on the GPUs, it will be just, you know, full and you have to be scheduled, then will be scheduled maybe on Saturday or Sunday. So please be, uh, let's say, a little bit careful. But in each of the different, let's say, contexts, we will remind you of that and go very much, you know, slowly forward. So once we have covered, let's say, the ap application ground, so this will be remote sensing, we really have challenges, lots of them. Not only the massive amount of parameters in deep learning and neural networks in general, but especially in deep learning, you will notice we have lots and lots of possibilities. Not only from the construction of the network, so how many convolutions should we have, what is the number of feature maps, these are all words that are not obvious to you, but it will materialize in the lectures, up to questions like which regularizer I use and what validation technique I can use. Uh, things like take one fifth for validation, which is a very good idea generally I talked last week about, uh, will we basically see tomorrow morning, once we really run overnight a model, a bigger model. So and this is something that we do at the end of the day. Today, in order to review tomorrow morning directly some challenges and how we can improve our accuracy and our architecture a little bit. Then, basically, as a next step, while we maybe tune here in their models and running them again, which actually takes quite some while, um, we refer to some of the interesting topics around deep learning that are already basically established, but will basically also shape the way of the future. And one of it is transfer learning. Where's where from transfer learning? It's a very interesting technique. Okay. So this is, of course, something uh, for those that are not so much know about that a very interesting idea of using pre-trained networks for new challenges. So you train a network on ImageNet, for instance, which is just, you know, classifying cats, dogs, horses, very simple data sets, but you use this trained model and the knowledge and the features from it in order to apply it to a new application domain. And also in remote sensing, I will give an example where this works exceptionally well. And it's in particular an interesting approach for engineering and uh, in general, perhaps, for science industry because the rare ground truth that you usually have, you can basically then a little bit help in the situation of just doing the feature learning and with this, in turn, you know, have much more samples you to train for. But this is something what we will explore in the transfer learning technique. And then at the end, really tomorrow afternoon, and in between, of course, we'll always go back to our models we use, we train, and see what we, you know, change there. And uh, basically what we come at the end of the day would be just another deep learning model, which would be the long short-term memory. Who has used long short-term memory before? LSTM cells? Okay, one. <laughs> they are, they're usually not that much known. They are very well suited for time series, right? So convolutional neural networks are for images. LSTM cells and the recurrent neural networks behind them are for time series. We look shortly into that just to give you the idea that deep learning is not always convolutional neural networks. So when you look now in the media, the hype around you know, image net classification challenges, the hype around big data is largely always in the context of convolutional neural network and images. But of course the idea of deep learning of more computing in the different layers it could be also applied to many other data sets. And the time series uh, would be just an, uh, one example that we will cover. Before we do a kind of summary and a kind of group assignment where we try to, you know, collect the data we have done over the day in order to find the best model together. Right, so this is really it from the start, from the morning. Any crucial questions before we go on? maybe from the organization point of view. We will have now two hours
really before we have lunch. Lunch will be provided here in the room, so we don't need to go. And can just make a very short lunch, come back to our modeling, basically to our running models on the machine. Anytime you have problems with accessing the cluster, with a job script, with a model <coughs> giving an error, raise your hand, right? Don't stay silent, because it should be really an interactive uh, tutorial here. We have many people in the room helping you, including me, that here and there can also help. Right. If there's no burning question, going once, twice. Okay, let's go into the material of the first lecture. And this would be really thinking about where deep learning algorithms come from. For that, we have to shortly review what artificial neural networks are. And I don't make a big picture out of it. Hence, we will go quickly <coughs> to aspects like backpropagation, how they are trained. And you will basically then see in later lectures, that's what we also do largely in deep neural networks. It's not a very much new thing in a sense, it's just much more layers. And the backpropagation is a bit tuned here and there. Still, the idea of the chain rule and so on will remain. So this is what we basically start in the beginning. We will nicely link to what we learned last time in the, in the kind of um, first ma machine learning lecture, which was a perceptron. Who remembers the perceptron from those that have been there? Very good. It's a very simple linear model, not so nice, but we will extend it to multi-layer perceptrons and artificial neural networks have some applications from science and industry, just to show you where artificial neural networks basically are used today, and perhaps where they can use deep learning tomorrow. But then we really want to dive already into deep learning, right? The artificial neural networks are just another model, so to speak, but of course we derive lots of things from it. That's why it makes sense to review them, but then we'll go in the quick kind of um, ideas of what is the key benefit, basically, of deep learning, which is largely feature learning. Right. We will talk about this, what we mean by feature learning, and through all over the course we will contrast it to feature engineering. Who knows and remember feature engineering from the last lecture or from your own work? Right, okay, yeah, so basically crafting features out of data manually. You have to do, you know, PCA, principal component analysis, difficult mathematical morphology structures to get neighborhood pixels, included in the classifiers, so lots of work to be done before you give it actually to the actual classifiers. That's what we did last week, right? Before we put it in the SVM, in the support vector machine, we did largely manual feature engineering. So an interesting takeaway message today will be, we can learn features automatically, and we have then during the course of today, really an application where one of my PhD students was doing that three years, uh, doing feature engineering, and now we see how we get better results in one month, creating basically a convolutional network with better accuracy. Of course, here and there we should think about this tomorrow morning when we think again about overfitting problems, which are in this context difficult and also something we have to review, especially if you get higher accuracy. We also should come back and think about some of the theory aspects we discussed last week of saying um, overfitting is a very complicated problem in machine learning and one of the most difficulties we have. This is something for tomorrow, so today we keep it easy and simple, going through the initials of deep learning. Here and there, of course, com parallel computing methods and architectures are part in the game, so we will always go to the job scripts, we'll execute, so a little bit around that would be, of course, now your takeaway message, you have to know what is a job script and so on, and we will talk this a little bit about when we start our first neural networks. So in the second part, then, we, we discuss a little bit why, basically, for problem computing, GPUs are quite nice these days, especially if you think about matrix vector multiplications, matrix multiplication, things you know which are in machine learning, a very eminent topic, if you remember some things from last week, where we see WX plus B, and, and these kind of models which really have lots of, lots of these multiplications, which could be nicely parallelized. And this is a key benefit that we will see in the idea of many core architectures like GPUs. We'll just get a little bit, some examples of NVIDIA and CUDA, just for you to get basically a bigger overview of what GPUs are, because not everybody is familiar with them. And then we will discuss how they program, but only to a very limited degree. Right? We already have here implementations for machine learning using GPUs, like TensorFlow, which is the backend that we're going to use in the course, so there's no point 
in really pointing out the whole details of CUDA programming or OpenCL, just for you as a takeaway so that you, of course, can also program them yourself. In the end, of course, we will try then to, to think about what Löwen has in terms of GPUs and how you use them in applications. So let's get going with the fundamentals and basically the overall idea of neural networks of the perceptron we had also last time, the simple models, is biology. So the inspiration of the human brain is largely um, our blueprint of how we model the neural networks, right? We have dendrites, axons, you have the connections between many, 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 many neurons of those, right? And this, of course, brings us already to the network character, which we last time a little bit neglected to use a perceptron and then jump to support back the machines. Now we we'll look how we can stack up different of these neurons in order to come to such a network like this. However, um, these connections are very important for us, and we will learn why, because these are largely these weights that we train, hence it's red. So if you want to think about what we can do in machine learning, think always about it's the weights that we learn, right? X, which is often in many models, is our constant. Right? That's our data that we have, and it goes sometimes to supervised output, uh, which is Y. Everybody familiar with supervised classification here? Okay, the majority. Very good, because that's what we had last time and that's what we're going to do today again. When we think about this, of course, it has limits, right? And this is an interesting thing. Now, if you think about that deep learning can maybe rule the whole world, or artificial neural networks, they have limits. Like here, we learn how to basically create an aircraft based on birds, but we still have no airplanes that actually flap wings, right? So there are lots of things which, which we still don't understand. Um, which we perhaps also not can tackle with deep learning. So when I basically talk about this, being very excited today, um, doesn't mean it can solve every problem in the world. However, what we have seen in recent media and in our own scientific evaluations and work with industries it is a very hot topic and very relevant today. So let's go into it. Before I just um, Think about you know um, going to neural networks. Let's go quickly back to the perceptron, which was really our core building block we had the last time, the simplest learning model that we have in machine learning, um, where we said we want to approximate more or less a kind of target function, which is in reality for machine learning a target distribution, because largely we have often kind of data elements where the same x goes in but different y's come out. Right? That is where mathematical is, equations are typically at the end. So we put a distribution around this. And we had some assumption in the statistical learning theory that there is a pattern to be detected, if you remember. If it's a complete random purpose or random process that generated the data, there's no point in machine learning right, when we don't find a pattern in that. And data we need, that's what you also know. That's what we established last time. So we put that in our training examples, have here vector rates of different features up to a dimension. And then we have also this guiding supervised output that we can use, you know, to train our system. So how we train? We have basically our solution tools around here where we said linear perceptron is just one of many, many hypotheses, right? We can have linear perceptron, we can artificial neural networks take here, uh, deep learning networks will come today. And they all go with some certain optimizing algorithm. In our case of the perceptron, it was very simple, just adding, subtracting a vector. But we see how today convolutional neural networks with stochastic gradient descendants will be much more uh, interesting and sophisticated. Giving our, let's say, guiding output, we can always have error measures, which are quite interesting. Right? For instance, mean squared error we had last time. Today we will basically extend that a little bit to other, um, like categorical um, cross entropy and so forth. But it's things where you know this is very flexible and depending a little bit on the application and how strict you are. In order to basically learn all of this, the key goal then would be at the end, pick one of all of these different models, G, which we pick out of the hypothesis, artificial neural network, perceptron, deep learning, or SVM with different parameters we did last time, and pick one which is approximately this kind of fellow over here. So that is the kind of very shortcut what we learned in the machine learning tutorial in a principled way. So let us look what the perceptron did. It was basically largely a sum of Wx uh, times b, and we had this interesting bias, if you remember, for the linear model. Uh, if everybody remembered, we also then did the trick and put that basically 
inside the vector coming to this interesting notion, which is nothing else, uh, W transpose X. What it really did is interesting because it also goes back to the late 50s, right? The basic algorithm just having a line shifted up and there, depending on the weights that you learn, right? And you optimize this by abstract, subtracting, adding vectors over time iteratively, and we have come to the conclusion that it actually converges for linearly separable data. So this is what we did last time, and if you consider that the late 50s still you know, are quite some time ago, they are nevertheless still the building blocks of deep learning networks that we have today. So still a kind of very old model being very relevant today. So one of the exercises here I wanted to push early to get your brains activated because we want to be a bit active without the cluster first. Now if you have this perceptual learning algorithm, how you would, would think of creating a line here? Anyone with the knowledge we had last time? So where would be the line? Leave alone SVMs, it's unfair for those that didn't participate last time, but the perceptron should be known, one line. Where do you put it for this data set? Is that possible? Anyone, just feel, not be shy, you know, from last time. Okay, no one has an idea, what could be a line? Okay, yeah? Can it first? Just the two green dots on the left, just below that. Like here? Going down and yeah. Okay. Right, but what about the linear model on this panel? Hmm, ouch, right? I think you will agree with me, there was another suggestion, I guess. You could yeah, also. I was going to say there is no best line because there, it's not linearly separable, so you always have an error. Exactly, that's what I wanted to hear, right? This kind of notion of soft margin, some errors. You could have many lines and this is a good idea. And many ideas will do probably the job quite okay. We're saying here and there could be outliers, if you remember from last time. But, of course, the problem is, if you remember, here and there it's just not possible to create one line. And there's a very famous um, example in computer science, also called the XOR problem here, um, where you just see it's impossible to have the linear model here, right? To separating basically these two uh, kind of colors. So what could be to the rescue? Stacking them up, right? Basically, why we should have just one line, or basically a linear dependency? Uh, we create now today non-linear models, and we will go through some of the non-linear functions later. But this is kind of a key idea. You could, for instance, do this, just as an example here, right? Two decision boundaries by just taking two neurons together, right? Stack them up, combine their weights, get them fully connected. <coughs> we also would call that dense. That's something what we will materialize also in terms of deep learning. And then, you know, add up to the Y output. And with this, you're much more flexible. And if you combine this even, Basically, then this nonlinear activation function gets really interesting of catching nonlinear dependencies. So this is what you here see is really an artificial neural network feed forward in the very trivial sense, two layer, um, really strictly going forward. There's no recurrent connections that we will do in lecture six, right? So strictly feed forward, and that's how you create basically your first model in neural networks. You take the idea of the perceptron that we had before, different axes in as the input nodes, you would sum them up based on the weights. And this signal do you put pass then combined with the bias of course through some function, right? This activation function that we said last time was not so important, but will be today very important. We will actually change different one of those. Right? They're different of those and we have a look. So when we think now how that looks like in the broader sense for the terminology, there's an input layer that is usually connected to some form of X, could be images, right? Pixels of images could be, for instance, in the recurrent idea, the time series data coming in and so forth. So the input layer is directly connected to the data at hand. You have the hidden layer, very interesting for us today because we're sitting in the deep learning lecture, meaning we're going to extend that significantly here. The types of hidden layers will be changing. The number of hidden layers will be changing. Right? Well, this is kind of the typical artificial neural network we would have done 10 years ago before deep learning. 
he would say that maybe adding one hidden layer more or maximum like two, because then you kind of have the limit of computational complexity, depending of course on the number of neurons you put in the hidden layer. I right? will do that significantly now in the kind of practicals which will follow up uh, basically from the artificial neural network. We can really play around with the number of neurons while the ones in the input layer are more or less a little bit given by the data at hand, right? It depends on your number of features or basically your dimensions. And then the output layer is often something we call a softmax. We will see how that materialized, where we gain a signal, get a probability distribution, and say, what class is it really, right? If you have a two-class problem that you've seen with red and green, that is, of course, extremely trivial. But if you remember the NBM tech, it's a 52-class problem very efficiently with 77% accuracy. And this, of course, uh, is something we have tried to beat today. And we see how convolutional neural networks will do that basically at the end of the day. So this is a kind of terminology. Um, from our approach in machine learning, nothing changed, in a sense, except our solution tools. So instead of the hypothesis of a typical perceptron, we take our skills and put them together, stack these different perceptrons up in different layers, as we have just noticed. However, also having now an algorithm that just extracting and subtracting vectors will not fly anymore. Right? Hence, we need a more sophisticated algorithm that is called backpropagation. And this beast, I have to say, is loaded, so we need some optimizer to really learn it. We have to think about why we need a backpropagation of error, why not just having the error directly computing, uh, which largely depends on in layers and so forth. But just take away the message that they both usually talk together. Right? Last week we learned to support vector machines here, had quadratic programming, or uh, sequential minimal optimization as optimizers, or uh, different models basically come always with different algorithms. So we will use back propagation mostly today in order to come to the same conclusion uh, of actually creating a function. And the function is interesting for us because it's really a function of a function of a function that we create uh, with the artificial neural network. That's not obvious to you. We will see that and how that materializes when we have the chain rule uh, basically in the second lecture today. So how it works, uh, when you create this now, you basically have to really think about Lego pieces in the sense of creating all of these layers together and Keras will be one tool where this is very nicely done. We have some parameters saying number of hidden units, which is largely those fellows here we create basically for each of the layers a model at, so then we basically can, can see kind of visual representations directly in the code, which is quite nice, compared, for instance, to TensorFlow and other, let's say, more low-level um, deep learning and artificial neural network packages. Hence, take away the message, when you have a deep learning package that we will use today, like Keras or um, also TensorFlow, Teano, Cafe, there are many around them, they have inherently the capability of creating neural networks because it's in a sense a small subset that is also often used at the end, for instance, to really get the signals right in the class distribution. We will talk about that, um, how that works. Now, the, a little bit I want to show um, why it's a problem basically of these weights to adjust them, right? If you learned the last time, the perceptron learns always the weights by adjusting them depending on the signals. Now, the problem we run to um, is basically that we always said we have a guiding output, right? And this is very nice in the output layer because I can use it then to correct, for instance, these weights where I just see, okay, what's computed here in my forward pass and I have some guiding output of saying, well, what you come, come, came out of the year, right, with all the weights summed up. This is actually, let's say, for instance, if you take here the mean square error, as an example, just the point-wise difference in a sense, right, from our predicted model that I have come out here and the one I really actually have, there's a, there's a problem that doesn't fit. So, change your weights. Right? This is very obvious to us, where we say there's no problem to do that here. But what if basically you need connections here, you don't have any supervised out output here? Right? And this will be a key thinking about, oh, we have to propagate this error backwards somehow so that these fellows which are happening here above will also be updated. So let's, let's get that in our mind, what that really means. 
But before we do this, we have to actually update ourselves very briefly on a typical um, kind of optimization uh, yeah. tool. Who knows gradient descent already? Oh, that's, I think for the majority that's very nice and we can go a little bit more quickly. Stochastic gradient descent? Okay. And the difference? Okay. Ah, one knows the difference. Can you enlighten us? No, I believe that uh, with gradient descent you just go to all your training examples and you compute the gradient of your power function to find the minimum. Mm -hmm. And with stochastic gradient descent you take randomly batches of inputs. Um, and then kind of find the mean gradients and follow that and take number. And that's and you take rather one, one sample at a time instead of the whole batches of training yeah. examples. Yeah, exactly. Very good. So I think the most of you have already this in mind, just then for the reference here on the slides. Right, we want to find a minimum of some kind of an objective function. That will be our cost function we talk about. And the way you do it is usually doing derivatives, right? And uh, you have here, for instance, an example of one where you would have a positive gradient and a negative gradient. And of course, when you are here kind of in the minimum, it gets still kind of stationary. That's how you can determine this. So the majority of you would be then also familiar with having a global and a local minimum. So I can skip that discussion a little bit. But largely what we do is, is this, we minus, right? This is an old position here and we minus the kind of gradient here in order to get more and more closer to this minimum. This is how it's stepwise done, iteration for iteration, by basically getting our error down. And there are different terminologies in that. So you see here just a couple of examples out of the kind of, of out of different literature, and they all essentially mean the same thing. It's of course important that you go into the negative direction, right? So even if you're positive, um, you take the minus. But more important for me is that you acknowledge a little bit this was standing here in the yellow box. And this would be a general theme throughout the whole lecture, right? Every time you see a yellow box, it's kind of important. In my students, I always say danger. This could be an exam question around the yellow box. So please um, uh, take these by heart and we will successively use them Right? So that's why it's important always to come back to this. But as one of the um, participants already said, we basically take the whole training samples in the typical gradient descent and in the stochastic gradient descent, you speed up the process of signing randomly. We go you know, sample by sample instead of wait for the whole kind of update. And this is quite nice because it converges faster in, in practice, really. But this is just one of the um, optimizers we have. Today, actually, this is not anymore the non plus ultra, you would say. Today, we have even aspects like momentum. We will talk about this way, not only take this idea of going down, but also kind of the velocity. And you have always an acceleration already, where you know, okay, which direction and where it's going, but with the velocity, there's a new approach in basically in the mechanisms we will talk about, uh, which is largely by the default today. However, in order to review what the artificial neural networks stand for and where they come from, we use SGD here in the beginning. So let's understand this backpropagation, as I said, right? Because it will be a key thing also to understand in deep learning. And we said now we can find the minimum of error, saying we have an objective function, could be, for instance, square error. We will see later also we have different versions of that. But here you basically have a kind of aspect that you want to train these, right? This is something what you know. This is also something what you know, right? It's your data set. But the problem is that these are initially unknown. You can randomly initialize. That's, for instance, a very good practice. And Keras and many of the deep learning tools will actually allow you this to initialize these weights differently, right? So random is just one example. And then what we need now is something to say how we update these things, a kind of update rule, right? Which is related now to this gradient descent as something what we want to update on each iteration, something similar like the perceptron is adding subtracting vectors, but a bit more sophisticated saying we really want to have here a systematic way. So when we think we have this kind of back propagation, you would think from the name backward y. Right? And in order to understand, we think first about the first phase, which is a forward 
And forward is, I think, very obvious. It's in a sense something already what you would consider if you know all of them already. You can deploy your model, for instance. You have learned the weights and you just use the neural network, right? That's what we call a forward pass, more sense, more or less. These weights are known and I put my signal through it and I will come to a conclusion of saying, well, this is class five, this is class seven, something like this. So the forward pass is very easy to do also because we have the architecture of the network. We know what are the neurons here, we know the activation functions to pass a signal through, and this will basically then multiply by weights, multiply by weights, and on and on multiply by weights. And at the end, basically I get to my conclusion. This is a forward pass, very nice. However, the backward pass now needs the kind of a trick, because as we were saying, the problem is a little bit in the hidden layers. We don't have that guiding output just at the last one. Right? So and this is a key thing of saying, um, when you have an update rule like this, and this here is something called the learning right, which we will see later, but you see basically from the error measure, whatever we pick, let's say mean squared error, we take the partial derivative with respect to w, and then basically step and update this with a kind of learning rate. Um, the learning rate will be a regularizing parameter we will see in the subsequent lecture, so don't think about this largely today. Basically, you can consider how quickly you go lower in the function, right? But it's something we will discuss thoroughly tomorrow morning, for instance, as one idea of tuning the networks. But however, that's how it works. You back propagate the error stepwise using the so called chain rule. And this is something I will show you in, con in the context of TensorFlow, actually, in the second lecture. So ignore a little bit the chain rule for a moment but it has something to do with, with the derivative of a function from a derivative of a function has a special property. And this is something what we can do now. We can actually update this way back, propagate the error we have basically taken from here because we got the signal out in the forward pass and now go back basically backwards. Now there will be a short movie on neural networks and then we go a little bit into practice. Issues with the microphone, but can you hear me behind in the last row? Okay, excellent. If not, you know, you can make me this sign or so, or show me this sign, then I know. Does it work? I know some of you have seen that last week already. Uh, for those of you, it's boring, but for the others, it's quickly get them up to speed what we think are multi layer perceptrons. And I got good feedback from my students, usually in the classes that, you know, videos like YouTube here and that help really understanding living images. So let's see if that works. The sound coming? No? Okay. It's not previously learned patterns. Technology duplicates this by creating a structure let's start again. Now we have the sound. This is a simulation of a single biological neuron. Information flows in, is processed by the neuron, and the results flow out. This gives the neuron its abilities to react based on previously learned patterns. Technology duplicates this by creating a structure that processes information like a biological neuron does, except this process is mathematical instead. Just like the biological neuron, the information flows in, is processed by the artificial neuron, and the results flow out. This single process becomes a mathematical formula that can be used for simple problems. For those that are mathematically inclined, this will look similar to a polynomial. A polynomial is limited to the problems it can solve for, as shown in this graph of an order five polynomial. If this is all artificial intelligence could do, it wouldn't be much use. 
As with the brain, artificial neural networks' power is in connecting sets of neurons together in layers. When you connect them in layers, the mathematical formula becomes something like a multi-dimensional polynomial. This allows complex problems, like what is shown in this graph, to be discovered and used for our benefit. As before, information flows in and results flow out. But this time, the input to the second layer is from the output of the first layer. The exact steps for a single layer are simply repeated for each layer of the neural network. Right. Okay, so that is essentially what you have seen, the function of a function of a function, right? Then in the end, the perceptron wanted to approximate and actually is then doing an activation function, so you have a function, and then you pass it to another function, which is saying the outcome of that function is actually put into another function, and that's how it all works, <coughs> catching also nonlinearities in data. Right, so this is a kind of summary in terms of uh, what you basically have in terms of multi-layer perceptron. And I think we will do now some, some practicals, and for that we use a Keras tool. Um, there's a question maybe? Yeah? yeah Just quickly. Go a little bit to the sure. multi-layer perceptron. So if you start from a, a single uh, which, layer Which slide, you mean, before we go? No, to I don't need to. Yeah, so okay. You, yeah, thanks. So if you start with a single layer perceptron, Mm -hmm. um, one of its weaknesses is that you cannot solve the nonlinear <coughs> classification problem. But if you add just one more layer, mm -hmm. you can already solve uh, a nonlinear classification. Uh, but then, what is the, uh, let's say, the advantage of adding more and more layer? Is there a real need for that? Is that what's the intuitive meaning of, of having more and more layer? Let's say four or five layers. Mm -hmm. But first of all, the complexity in the data, that's the key motivation, right? Where you would say many of the things you would actually approximate with a network like it's this. We would say it's a universal approximator with having like of two hidden neurons. And there's a kind of statements in the literature of saying you can approximate every function with that, right? So this is the key idea of the neural networks and where they're very good in. They need lots of massaging to get to this because you have to tune all the different number of neurons all the weights, uh, connections, and creation of the network. But still, let's say with two layers, you can approximate that. However, what we have seen is they're, you know, general in layout. You just have neurons, nothing else, and a couple of layers. So what deep learning then, in contrast, basically, to your question is doing, it adds different specific types of layers, which are particularly well suited for civil problems. Like, for instance, in the LSTM cell, they will put a memory for time series so that you understand more like a typical <coughs> neural network, which is not in this one, for instance. It has no memory. It's just to show you an example where there's no the point of going to deep learning into <coughs> more layers and layers when you can do already everything with a two layer, right? For instance, it's not completely true because you don't have memory in time, right? When you think like Chinese character translation, you have lots of lots of Europe you know, talking, 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 one Chinese character, <coughs> right? And the network would have forgotten that, in a sense, right? But the LSTM cell will keep in a memory like this. But we will talk about this in lecture six. Similarly, we will talk about the images. So remember, if to, in order to get good accuracy, we stick basically lots of feature engineering before we go to the neural network, right? We did lots of massaging of the data. And we see that lots of these are typically, you know, getting neighborhood pixels involved, spatial, not only, let's say, other dimensions. So this means there is some, some idea of using also specialized layers, again, for specific purposes. Right? So it's a kind of uh, here and there answer um, with some examples. I hope that satisfies your, your answer. But it will become more clear when we go to lecture two, lecture three, when we have correct examples. Uh, why there's now a need for that. In principle, you can do a hell of a lot with neural networks, but it's also about training them, the time it takes, which you maybe can shortcut in terms of epochs when you use a dedicated purpose convolutional neural network with images instead of a typical artificial neural network. And I provide some examples, and we will see in the practicals how we see that personally in the different batches and epochs that we require actually to do so. Good. Any other burning um, questions before we proceed to the practicals? Yeah. 
I cannot seem to find the slides online. So there's a link in the email reports. Yeah, okay. So it gives the slides for the course. <coughs> Um, yeah, I think it's on the website on the on the course, but there's already one helping you. So um, yeah, let's proceed a little bit. Who has from you heard about Keras before? Okay, Keras is um, very attractive today um, for many reasons. Um, firstly, where I would like to stick in this lecture to is it can create for us artificial neural networks. However, Keras itself is a high-level tool. It needs a backend, right? That's why you will see in the job scripts that you will execute now and so on. TensorFlow is basically under the hood. But I wait a little bit with this just to have not everything in the first lecture, right? We will do TensorFlow in the second lecture much more, but stick to Keras in the moment in the sense of what we discussed in terms of layers. And this is really very nice. And Keras, you see here just an example of two of the main building blocks you've seen in the neural networks before. So here you have a layer called dense, which is nothing else than fully connected between all the different neurons. Right? If you remember the last artificial neural network we have seen, it has a connection with weights to every single neuron. And that is something what we call dense in the more, let's say, deep learning um, literature, um, but which is nothing else than fully connected. You see lots of different regularizers, aspects that we take tomorrow, right? Regularization will be a key scene tomorrow morning. Today we'll keep it simple so that you can execute directly neural networks, start with a very simple perceptron, add a couple of hidden layers, and this in context of an application example. Also when we talked about how now this neural network is optimized, uh, we basically already introduced a stochastic gradient descent, right? And it has certain parameters, uh, momentum and so on, and here's actually the Nesterov was actually something I was alluding to, saying this is much more today one of the kind of additions, so if you go to practical problems you would probably use the Adam optimizer or use SGD with the Nesterov velocity and you know kind of the new approaches of really using this more momentum and so forth. But this is really advanced topics, right, so in the moment just stick to the idea of dense layer, SGD, that's what we learned, and how we can create now something in Keras which is actually kind of uh, uh, in line with this problem. So what we're going to do is classification, just a link to basically also last week. We really want to think about now an application where we have already data, right? And in our examples, it will be handwritten number digits, so it will be not a two-class problem as simplified put here. It will be a ten-class problem that we're going to work together today the whole day and look on some of the examples tomorrow. But the key idea is the same. You basically have di digits with someone already kind of labeled of saying 0 to 9, and when we get a new digit, we want to find out is it a 5, is it an 8, a handwritten one, or is it a 1. And that's something where we now explore how neural networks actually do the job quite well, but how we can improve even on that with convolutional neural networks. Before we go there, um, take away the methods. This is really a very simple um, application example that we're going to do together, right? Where some of you would say, well, why we need at all of this, uh, let's say, deep learning and so on. Uh, take away message, there are much more practical ones out there in the field. This is a domain of remote sensing. It, we will come to it, right? Actually, also already today, towards the end of the day, we will have much more complex settings. But in order to get a tutorial, to get it in the brain of everyone how it works, the MNIST digital character recognition is quite useful. And you see here, usually how it is, the people use artificial neural networks, use support vector machines, things we learned last time used, and also like a kind of random forest ensemble methods in decision trees, it's another classifier, and you would combine all these and would think where are the best ones. And you see, depending on which optimization you take here and there, Artificial neural networks are really, really good already. In some of them, actually, where it's a bit more robust and not so much, you know, parameter space exploration and time for parameter optimization is there, SVMs are quite nice. That's why we had it last time in our lecture. But this should take away the message that you would not necessarily also consider one model for a complex problem, right? Like we do now with MNIST, we specifically say neural network 
then on this data, you probably, from practice, would really consider different classifiers in order to solve that problem. One famous example I just want to quote, who knows the Netflix price? Of course, those last, from last week know that, right? The Netflix, the one million, just the impact. Now, we will discuss today how we improve on 1%, 2%, and actually with deep learning, maybe up to 10% or, or 7%. You would think like, okay, that's not a big deal, right? But this is an interesting example where just 10% improvement for a company is actually worth $1 million. So they basically had this kind of Netflix as a movie rental, and when their customers, they kind of rate movies they like, and of course, then the idea is, um, when we improve that system, we can do better recommendations. And 10% only better recommendations is really very much worth for the company because they will have much more revenues then, much more recommendations to the point of the kind of properties of the people. And with this, for them, the $1 million for the price, for the winner, is just a very small part. This should be a little bit the, the kind of point towards our practicals now when we talk about, we are already at 90%, we are 92, 94, 99. So this is something where you think like it's not so much, but think about the examples out in the field where 10% can make a huge difference for a company. And the Netflix actually was kind of worn by a kind of really uh, modified neural network. If you want to read it, this is one is the, the reference to it. So coming to the practical problem at hand for you here in the assignments uh, that we have as part of the tutorial. Who has worked with MNIST before? Someone? Okay, handwritten character recognition? No, no, not so many. It's unusual because if you usually buy a machine about a machine learning book or statistical learning book or data mining book, MNIST is usually often a kind of example that you find in the field. Hence, there's lots of material about it. Um, what you see here is basically how it looks like. You have lots of people that typically write handwritten you know, characters differently. So that's hence handwritten. Would it be automatic, created by a machine? That would be probably not necessarily a kind of requirement to do machine learning. It would be much more simpler. But with the handwritten recognition, you see here, and there are, of course, several problems. So they look very much limited to some of the different you know, characters we know or the digit that we you know kind of is, is very much here on the corner. Let's pick this one, for example, right? What you would think, is it a one? Who thinks it's a one on the corner? Okay, a couple. And who thinks it's a seven? How do you know? Good question, huh? So that's, of course, a pattern now to find out. But we see, we learn from many people doing this, maybe here, maybe here, maybe here. We learn certain properties. Of course, between these hard cases, this is really hard to find. But you have, let's say, some, some very simple examples where you would say, like, you can always think like a one or so is occupied, occupying less pixels, or you would say they're basically kind of having no pixel occupied uh, that is in the outer region. So there is a pattern to be detected depending on the different digits. And that's what the machine learning algorithm now is looking at step by step. The beauty in it, when we look into the metadata a little bit, it's a, a prepared subset of a very big one that we don't touch today. And the nice thing is it's already labeled, which means for us we know exactly from certain amount of it, um, this is a zero, this is a four, this is a one, we know the digits. That's how we can learn it. And basically it's separated in two kind of problems, 60,000 training samples, roughly 50 MB, and then 10 MB or 8 MB here around 10,000 test examples. So this is something what we last time discussed a lot and we'll discuss tomorrow a little bit, the kind of cutting in different training test sets. But everybody's familiar with training and test sets, right? It will be a key thing today where I don't have time really to go into it. If you have problems understanding training and testing and then validation, please take into account the lecture we had last week. Right? It was all about it, the problem of K, uh, kind of cutting them and so forth. Right, so it's 10 classes, hence 0 to 9, right? There's 9 digits. And they are already kind of size normalized, which is a nice aspect as well. So the data from the image perspective is very easy, let's say, to put in a pixel-wise vector. That's what we will do when we prepare the data a little bit. 
right? And it's often used for experiments and so forth. So when you think about the intensity value, so what is actually the real value that we have then in all the pixels is nothing else than a grayscale intensity value. You would say like, depending on how the people write, sometimes more enthusiastically here, the zero uh, combined maybe to another zero that you see there. So you see here the grayscale intensity values per pixel where you have white to basically black and then you basically um, have this already done in all of the different tutorials and packages. This is mostly the one you can already simply download, right? So there's no point for us doing it ourselves. We already prepared that for you in the job scripts, in everything. Um, but of course, take away the message. You can download it if you want, also from the official down, uh, website. There's a small part in it. You see the Keras or to TensorFlow, they already basically have part inside and we will use it again and again in the job script so I will tell about it again. However, you see also here the one hot equals true, which is nothing else than creating basically a vector and saying you have a 10 class um, item and say where is actually now the digit. You know, and this one is you, what you basically indicate then with a one while all others are zero. So if you have an eight, let's say, as, as a kind of real digit somewhere the label then would be hot encoded, meaning you have kind of a 10 uh, vector from zero index to nine, and you would just actually highlight then the sevens when it's a kind of eight, starting from zero, right? Usually as in computer science. This is a one hot encoded true. It's a typical machine learning thing. It has nothing to do necessarily only with MNIST, but it's something what we assume right now here in the data set, just to make the uh, mathematical more convenient in the one, in a way. And let's go to the exercises now. So the first thing we're going to do is actually trying to log into the University of Ghent cluster. This is the most important thing right now. Please do that now so that we can see if that's going to work. SSH in two with accounts that have been given to you before the tutorial. Make sure you're logged in. If it doesn't work, if you have any questions. Exactly. So we wait a couple of seconds, but I assume everybody is logged in. Who has not yet logged in to Ghent? Who is not able to use SSH and your VSE da -da -da account? No one? So everybody is successfully logged in. All right, excellent. Good, then we can go forward. This is the cluster we're going to use just as an information. So it's a very important thing when you log in. It could be that your network connection is broken or that you have to re-log in for any other purpose after lunch, whatever. Think about you have to do a specific command to go to a specific cluster always. So let me tell you what that cluster is. We use here the tier two <coughs> clusters, which are actually several ones. And they have everything for us provided. You go in with the SSH keys and so forth. But we're going to use just Golet, right? And this is a key important thing to understand here that we have different options. But for us in the tutorial, we use a Golet cluster. Hence, every time you log in, you have now, uh, let's say, a broader capability. You basically have to do this kind of command to swap to this specific cluster. So before you do anything in computing, right? Like QSub, we will see the job scripts we had last time and today new ones with neural networks. Before you do anything, on the cluster, the first thing always you go in, module, small cluster, golem. Then you basically at the, at the cluster, your home directory will not change. Everything when you do a list in your home directory, you have the same data, you have your home directory. That's not going to change because it's mounted everywhere. So this is still an important part. Please do that now as well. And if there are problems with it, just let us know, right? And raise your hand. That, we, that some people can help you. Also check the mail I sent this morning with the practical information. It also has a reservation ID to submit jobs in. All right. Yeah, the information just again that came per mail would be very crucial for us with a reservation because then we can use the cluster directly. The reservation helps us that we're not scheduled like any other production user. 
but in the tutorial you kind of first come and uh, uh, kind of having a nice priority. And of course this will vanish once you leave this tutorial, um, you will be back to the normal production user. So it's a very nice property today to have that. That's why I encourage you also to participate in the practicals, submit jobs. As you will see with the GPUs, a bit more careful because we have just a couple of them and you're quite an audience here. So, but the CPUs in Ghent, when you now do the practical this neural network experiment, right? We will see what that means. Add a layer, remove a layer. Add more neurons, remove neurons, right? You can really experiment it around. I just gave a few examples here now. Uh, just as an indicator how you should use Keras to do that. But please feel free to, while I'm doing more of the theory all over the day, to really use the cluster as you like. Submit, submit, look at the output, bad accuracy, maybe two less hidden layers, more accuracy, or it takes awful long, too many hidden layers, maybe, right? We will come to the notion that if you add and add and add hidden layers, uh, and you do this just with CPUs, you will see there will be problems. Right? In this sense, um, experiment around, but don't do it to the most degree right, of blocking everyone else. That is the other extremum, of course, if you now add lots of lots of hidden layers and then submit 50 jobs, no others will be maybe scheduled. Right? But still, experiment with the system <coughs> as you like. Now, being on the system, um, we have a specific directory for our tutorial, um, which, which actually will help us. Um, and you should basically do that and copy that in your home directory. Um, I just think about this is the directory well, I'm going to show you in the practical. So this is my home directory, of course. So I will show you where you have to go to find all the scripts right now in the practical. The reason why you have to copy that is, of course, when you make changes, you don't want to have the changes from your neighbor. So in this sense, think about that you first copy all of the stuff in your home directory and we will show how it works and demonstrate a little bit what I just said everybody of you should consider. Be careful if you copy in your home directory, the data sets are too big for your home directory. So do it in data or scratch or somewhere else. So check the mail. Yeah, and we will mostly do the script copying now, right? Not, not the data. Yeah, the mail says to copy everything. Ah, okay. Well, and if you have done, done so already, of course, then there's no point of doing it again. So here you see I logged in, as I just discussed, and what we just do as the first time always is module swap plus uh, golet. Last week we came to the notion of golem, I think, but it's really golet. And once you've done that, now the interesting artwork can start with JobScript is working on the cluster. Right, so this is your home directory. Of course, for me, it's a little bit different stuff inside. Everybody can see that in the, in the back. Now what I'm typing, it's big enough, yeah? Okay. So where we prepared everything for you is just in the email, as well as here now you see apps, scan tutorials, deep learning. <coughs> I just go there a little bit inside, just explaining a little bit what's there. Um, there's Indian pines. Don't touch that now. We will come to this later on, right? I will explain what it means around Indian pines. You have MNIST. That's what the scripts. What we're interested in now, and of course the slides that you have here from the tutorial. As you remember, we are tackling first all the MNIST parts. So that's something what you now should do and look. Basically, we are in this directory for those who can't follow so quickly. Please change to this directory. Or those that are very familiar with Unix, use your Unix commands that you know already with copy, you know, to get all the material out of this one into your home directory. There are different ways how you can do it, obviously. One way would be just saying copy star into tilde. if you are inside that directory. Okay. So everybody has done that. Anyone who has not have now the files in her, in her or his home directory. 
Okay, please get your hands up, then the people can help you. And uh, actually, we wait a, just a half a minute or so before we proceed. The others can spend the time um, already looking in some of the Python files that will help us also in the job description files. Feel free to explore a bit, don't change anything yet, don't submit yet, but look a little bit to get a feeling for that before we move on and waiting for the couple of people. Everybody is, is ready. There's no one having a problem with copying the files anymore. No hands. Excellent. So let's proceed a little bit. So the particular ones we're interested in from all of these files you just copied is these two fellows in the moment. We will come to the others later on, but this is basically the Kera script we're going to use. It is in Python, so we will discuss it, what it means. Who has programmed in Python before? Ah, okay, so almost everyone knows basically the, the syntax and everything. It's a nice, nice language, we'll come to it. But for us, of course, in the tutorial, we will look a little bit what the, how we create the layers and so forth. However, don't execute this in a typical Python way, right? Don't do that, how you would do your normal serial scripts in your home directory. We will do a remote submission to the cluster using a job submission script called job INN. That's something what we also will discuss, right? Just preventing from everybody now uh, actually using the login node or doing lots of modeling, then we will see that the login node gets into problems, right? So please wait and bear with me. Um, we will come to this now step by step. So the first model we're going to target is, in terms of this kind of um, uh, MNIST problem, really something very simple where we have a little bit here now the discretion around the parameters and data normalization, which is one part, right? When you go now inside this Python script, you basically see that, and I just copy paste it here just to make a couple of points with it, right? So the first parameters <coughs> is number of classes 10. That's basically what we knew from the digits problem. There are 10 digits, so 10 classes, zero to nine, right? The number of epochs we discussed already a little bit in the terms of uh, kind of the stochastic gradient descent. So this is the overall iterations through the whole data that you have, right? So the number of epochs matter. We will see how that materializes when we now use 200 epochs and, and some in the hundreds and later sometimes just 20 are enough, right? When you use specialized layers in, in deep learning. However, the epochs will be a very interesting parameter to look in. We look also on this more thoroughly tomorrow morning, all of these parameters, right? But let's have first a very, let's say, very simple idea how we create an artificial neural network. And then we basically have the batch size, which is kind of the training instances we take before each of the individual updates, also what we a little bit discussed already. And the optimizer we take was in the theory as well, the SGD, uh, stochastic gradient descent, SGD for short. So that's what you basically have in terms of parameters. The number of hidden, we wait for that for the next one. However, we can already look at it. This will be, of course, the number of hidden layers. There will be a topic called validation tomorrow. So ignore that in the while. We have it included, but it's something, you know, just for doing proper modeling. We will come to it tomorrow morning on the challenges, right? Of saying how much you should split the validation data, comparisons, uh, training and testing set. However, you will see in the optimization that's already part of it. 
So much for the parameters, basically, of the network. How we create it will be a different story. In terms of the data, it is, needs to be a little bit reshaped in terms of um, the kind of idea how it is generally stored. Basically, if you look at it, it's now a kind of 28 by 28 uh, rows and columns. And what we just do here, basically, is a reshape in kind of a vector with uh, 784, which is just a multiplication of all these pixels. So in a way, we have really a very nice one data structure per image. And what you have in each of these different, let's say, vector elements is always the kind of gray intensity that we discussed, right, on the theoretical. Now that's a bit more into practice. Um, we discussed there are 60,000 training examples and 10,000 test examples. Hence, we create different um, structures for this that we then also indicate that they, should, uh, that they basically all should be considered as a float just to make the computing more useful. <coughs> then we do a step here called normalization. Who is familiar with normalization and why we take more lower numbers? Okay, usually it helps like not having very huge numbers. In this example, we just divide by the maximum right, that we have in terms of the, the gray intensity, which would be 255. It's a better way of computing the weights than if you normalize that data, because we multiply, if you remember, multiply and multiply through all the weights in the network. So this would be then astronomical large numbers, for instance. We just give the data out in a sense of saying, okay, do we really have all the samples there in the gate? Again, the difference between training and testing will be a little bit obvious in our tutorial today, but how we exactly differentiate between those of saying why we need 60,000 and why only 10,000 is a topic for tomorrow morning. So a simple model we discussed, right? And the simple model is essentially uh, a neural network which is just more or less a perceptron, right? So our first idea is really having an extremely simple model, um, but then putting it through a nonlinear activation function. So what do I mean by this? This is usually here, this one kind of just one of many, right? So we will come to this. We have a rectified linear unit, we have softmax, we have uh, also others, uh, if you want, sigmoid is still there. So there are different ones. Let's stick in the moment to the softmax. It has a very nice property of saying at the end that we have a kind of probability distribution. It crushes all the values, basically, that we get from all the layers in the end, in this neuron, between 0 and 1. And if you're a little bit in statistics, you know that's kind of transferable to probability. And for this, where the signal of the class is essentially the highest one, the highest probability, that's where we fire that specific class. Right? So this is the idea of the softmax. However, if you remember, before we need to do something else, we have the kind of number of classes as an input neuron with all the x's going in. And this is a parameter we discussed before. And in this reshaped fashion, if you remember, in this long vector. So this is really perhaps one of the most simplest models you can create with Keras, right? It is not deep learning. Admittedly, it's not a very fancy artificial neural network, but you have to agree with me, it's very simple to create, right? You just have a model. You say it's sequential, which means nothing else. You put layer onto layer onto layer and will be sequentially worked on. Tomorrow we will see that the back end of it called TensorFlow will do more a graph-like structure, right? And we will talk about it what it means, but it will be lecture two, um, basically later on, and then also tomorrow here and there. Um, the, the kind of loss function that we had before was mean squared error in the example of the theory, but we can also have, um, for instance, a categorical cross entropy with this interesting formula. Um, it's, it's basically just, again, the idea that you take you know, the differences and look a little bit on a different way on the one that you predicted, at this particular point in time versus the one you know you kind of um, have in your target or in your data set. So the metrics we put in the moment accuracy just to make a certain point when we do the practicals, when we submit and submit. And in the end we get just uh, basically the idea of compiling a model. Um, that's what we always need in order to um, start the process or compile the model, which will be then translating of the backend implementation uh, so something where it leaves Kera, so to speak, but it's not visible to us. And when it's really start the computing, we fit a model, right? Which is the next one, uh, basically there, but it's very obvious. Um, people have used other tools like R or MATLAB before, 
right? Usually you have function like fit, uh, where you fit the model and so on. And here we have all the parameters we specified before, batch size, the number of epochs, the verbose is just to give more output, and validation split as we discussed, and we will discuss tomorrow morning. Hence, if that is running, our machinery gets processed, and we do an evaluation on score and accuracy at the end. However, before we do this now longer and longer, uh, this kind of discussion, let's do it practically. Everybody of you has a job script now, right? Um, this is now important that you execute this with the reservation, right? Again, so the job script has no reservation in sight, so we have to add this on the command line. I think here, Kenneth, you could maybe help me a little shortly because I don't remember it exactly. So we do uh, QSAP minus E, right? No, no, that's interactive. Yeah. No, no, minus, you know the term? Or just make for reservation? Yeah. Yeah. Because now we need to QSAP command with this job script but using the reservation that you got in the email. Right? You can also do the steps in the email. I don't have in the moment here the access to the email, that's why we do it this way. But just to emphasize on it, it's important that you do exactly this reservation now and use it because then you will be directly scheduled in terms of uh, computing power. Does that look right? Yeah, yeah so <coughs> maybe we can quickly together review it as a group. So for you, check the mail and copy paste from the mail. Exactly. So on the on the mail, it should be basically exactly this term. If you see an error, just straight scream now. Or if someone has problems executing it, then raise your hand. Okay. We have people in the room who can help. So when this happening, you basically have submitted now the job to the cluster. The neural network will take a while, so it's not that it's directly coming back, right? So this is now a difference to your R, to MATLAB, to SAS, to the serial tools. You have a batch submission, so you are scheduled, and then basically go go to another um, part of the cluster where the job is happening. So that means you get a job ID back that you see here. Oh, okay. And I just got from one of my friends here that I have a typo in the reservation. We're going to fix that, but stick to that what is in the email, right? In the email you probably have a better corrected version. And this is always very, so it's something which is just for this tutorial today, now active. So it will vanish uh, next week, it will be not possible. Then you just use a typical QSAP with a job island. So this is a modification here for the tutorial in order to get you directly scheduled. Yeah, it's English. Okay. <laughs> what do you need? Colon. Yes, correct. And AD, that's correct. Like this? Yeah. 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 That's not the English word. And? With D? With D? Yeah. With D? Yeah. That's correct. That's in the phone again. Q, 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 so you see there was a typo um, and please use this particular one but again everybody of you should get in an email right with all that information how to submit and so on and use that information as well so this will take some time and the status you can for instance look at if you do QSTAT basically with QSTAT you should see your job ID somewhere doing something. You see here one example is that I have a running job and a queued job. Um, just, you know, you can track your status of the job on the cluster with QSTAT and then see basically where you are. 
It has a more elaborate version if you want with QSTAT minus A, where you see everything. You see your job ID, which is most important, so different type of jobs. You see which queue, but what is the job name? So that we have the artificial neural network, the session ID on many tasks, and what would be basically the wall clock time, and that it's running, and the elapsed time. Again, if this reservation now doesn't work for you and you see nothing in QSTAT, if QSTAT is empty for you for some reason, raise your hand. Right? Then we have to look into it. And here's an issue. No. There's no problem, there's no output yet. Right? The output will come. So the server is now in Kera, is now working on it, and so forth. So let's look a little bit and use the time to understand the job script. So just a small explanation for the job script, because you should be encouraged also later to use it on your own. Right? When once this tutorial is finished, there is no problem of using here the machinery in Ghent, also everywhere else in Flandern or even beyond in Belgium or even beyond that if you want to have you know, a real sophisticated time in other centers using such kind of a job script. So let's talk about it. Here you have the number of nodes, basically, which translates to how many cores you really use from the machinery. That's always required. The wall time specifies how long you expect your job to be. So we will see that doing a, a convolutional neural network, for instance, later on, with a really sophisticated data set will go above one hour. So for now, for scheduling reasons, in order to use backfilling of schedulers, just do that as most as realistic as you can. Right? In the moment, for some of you who don't have any idea how long it takes, we take one hour. But if you now get a feeling for it, how long it takes, you here and there can adjust this, of course, also when you go out of this tutorial. Right? Because otherwise, after one hour here, your job will be automatically killed. Right? Let's consider you create your own data set, you want to have an artificial neural network used with your data, and it will run and run and optimize according to stochastic gradient descent and error will be reduced. Even if you don't have you know, this process finished, it will be cancelled and removed from the cluster. The wall time is, is basically a very important one. That's why you have to be a little bit with a buffer in mind that there's enough time to finish. However, please don't put that 10 hours, right? Because that's not the time you need probably for the artificial neural networks now. Um, a little bit it makes sense to rename those properly, right? To be a little bit more cleaner. Here we say Keras, we use the MNIST data set with an artificial neural network. No details, there's no space for it. You will see it also not in QSTAT, very detailed, very important. In order to now work with the frameworks we just discussed and will discuss in the remaining lectures, we will use TensorFlow as a back end. I will talk in lecture two about it, right? Then we will know more what TensorFlow really is. We know Keras, and we will basically use them in a specific version. Just always when you want to consider using them, you have to use them both. Just using Keras will not help, because the, all the implementation is basically in the end in TensorFlow, when it comes to the matrix multiplications, the lower level aspects of computing. In the moment we use CPUs, right? There's also a bit of differentiation to, let's say, the end of the days where we'll use GPUs. Um, however, in Keras backend, in the moment, it is enough to say we use just TensorFlow, right? So that's how it basically is related. We go to a specific work directory. Um, this is now not so important. It creates one sandbox. We say basically it creates some space on the cluster for your job. It's not anymore in your home directory. It's some certain sandbox just basically for this job to play around. However, there will be everything in terms of output for you. Right in the sandbox, the files which are there. So it makes sense here and there to copy things inside the sandbox. It's what we will do later. And to you know, when you want to see what's coming out or what's basically inside the working directory, uh, you can go there. Um, here's just a kind of short um, part where we say we limit a little number of threads. In practice, you not necessarily have to do that. It depends on the cluster. Here for the tutorial, it's useful to do of limiting the threads. And uh, this is basically now what we call. You see, it's different from doing it just serial on your command time, just doing Python and run. 
because then you do it basically essentially on the login node. What we will do now, we basically execute this inside this interesting directory from the scheduler um, and then basically can, uh, can execute this on the cluster on the allocation that we get from this system. So we are not anymore basically on the login node, we are somewhere deep inside the cluster on allocated nodes. And with this you can share it with everyone, everybody gets different cores and the login node stays free from computing. Right, so let's go a little bit in the question like who has done that now? Who has submitted successfully? Okay, good feeling, right? So I still see some hands not up. So the other way around. So what's the problem? If you have a problem, please raise your hand. Right, we want to take everyone on board and it might be just a small typo somewhere, a capital instead of a small letter. Um, it could be anything, right? Just a very small typo changes the perspective. However, the majority of people have done it, so we have to go forward in order to stay with time, right? But still, if you are lagging behind or have problems, raise your hand. There are people here that always can help you in between. So what we should get out of this is something we will discuss once you're ready, right? Just for the slide's sake, is basically something where you should consider you get at the end some kind of accuracy from all the epochs. And you see a nice overview that you have a dense layer with, you know, the shape of 10. That is our, basically, the 10 that we discussed in terms of classes. And then you basically have the number of parameters with essentially saying, you know, depending on so many um, kind of uh, signals we get, we multiply that and with this all by weights W. So the amount of parameters by having a fully connected net is already something, right? And we will see how that gets more and more. The validation set here is a little bit we keep for tomorrow, we will discuss it, but it has something to do with proper model selection. However, the interesting, most interesting thing we are interested in at the end should be something like this, which is 0.92 translating to roughly 92%, uh, right, on the handwritten character recognition. Keep that in mind when you are now listening to more of the GPU theory uh, a little bit, so that we're interested in that. When you don't get such an output in the end, again, raise your hand, right? There must be something difficult. Could be that, you know, um, an error occurred during your run, but we have experts here uh, at the, uh, that always can basically help you. Right, so let's go ahead a little bit. Um, what is deep learning? Because now we're interested um, to learn a little bit what's now the step to go from artificial neural networks basically to deep learning. Right, so and we know that a little bit perhaps um, already from feature learning. Who has heard about feature learning already? Okay, yeah, interesting, good. Not so many. It's a kind of traditional approach that you do with neural networks, with support vector machines we did last time, right? And the last machine learning lecture was really taking the data, transform, uh, do dimensionality reduction, um, principal component analysis. There are different, let's say, ways how to massage the data, we call it as practitioners. We work on the data to get it really into more features, which actually help the classifiers, for instance, to get better. Right? And you usually can see, if you remember last time, we had the raw Indian pines, 40% accuracy. But with the interesting feature engineering with the mathematical morphology using neighborhood pixels, in a, in a kind of tree-wise shape, shape of fashion, we had like 77%, right? So in this sense, it really matters that you do that. Just throwing data on the modeling usually is not a good idea, right? That's what we had in the past. Now we will see how deep learning is actually changing the story. So this is something what we, what we have shown last time, for instance, this is Estab. Um, this was this kind of mathematical morphology, if you remember. If you're interested in that also, you can have the lectures of the material from the last week basically available online. And you can, of course, uh, look at the recordings. However, um, this is kind of the typical way, state of the art, how it was done. Now, what we now see as a major difference between perhaps the traditional aspects where we have used and what is now happening in deep learning is this deep feature <coughs> learning, right? There are several other, let's say, differences in terms of types of layers, we come to that. But the key essence is, in order to do the modeling, kind of as part of the modeling process of the optimization of the learning, really, the features will be learned with it. 
And this is a very interesting property when you think about that traditionally, for instance, one of my PhDs, where I was saying, was taking like three years working on proper features to increase that in the Indian pines last uh, year, where we now have this automated, this process, at least to a certain degree. Right? So this is one of the takeaway messages, deep feature learning. We have some examples later on. And the interesting aspect also with it, it takes basically less time than the whole solution, right? Because usually uh, you would say like the kind of feature engineering is 80% or 70% of your time. The modeling is usually very, very, you know, a typical standard process, giving it to an SVM, an RNN package, uh, maybe also random forests, and you try them out. However, the, the more drastic aspect is usually in this kind of part. So with this, you also save hell a lot of time. However, it's not completely true, right? We also have to create the architecture of these deep learning networks. That's why there's a whole tutorial about it. It's not anymore just to feed forward two hidden layer network, throw the same network on the data and it will work. So there's still a process of creating the architecture. In a way, you would see like the time invested here is a little bit transformed in creating a proper model to specific problems. And this is what we're going to basically talk on later on. And uh, this is actually the key idea. And this is really actually used. We have interesting results in neurosciences. If you remember from last week, we had this interesting brain cuts that we discussed. Um, and we can actually learn different cortical regions in the uh, pseudo-architectonic cortical regions here in the human brain using a convolutional neural network. However, the neuroscience data is huge. So no point on bringing that in a tutorial. Plus, also, it's usually not really very open, but just take away the message, especially for big data sets, this is now a crucial thing to do. The MNIST data set is an extremely small toy data set, still captures the essence of the accuracy that we will discuss. Now, how deep learning looks from the features is best explained by these gentlemen here from this paper, if you're interested to in reading it. But the key message to take away is, again, that you can automate so many things with it that you transform the time from feature engineering, manual feature engineering, into letting it do done by the deep learning machinery. Could be convolutional neural network, but also LSTMs are quite good in this. The convolutional neural networks have the nice property. You can look a little bit inside the layers, inside the signals, how they learn. Something I cannot show you in the tutorial completely. I will just give pointers tomorrow. Um, but you can a little bit see how the layer by layer by layer learn aspects. And the initial ones are really doing like corners, edges, very simple things which you basically learn in order to have any object recognized. And then if you go up layer by layer, you actually see whole faces or elements of faces coming into game, like eyes, ears, properties, where you would say that's how you basically recognize a human. And the same is actually true for cars. You would learn wheels in one of the higher layers. Right? And then elephants, and here is just examples. <coughs> the nice property we also a little bit will discuss with you know, weight sharing and aspects like in lecture two is it could be even missing information, and convolutional neural networks are unbeaten in a sense in that. You see here, you still recognize the image, of course, as a human, but also the convolutional neural network, although the second eye is gone. And you would say maybe it's not a human if it just has one eye. Right, but combining all the different features that you learn in so-called feature maps and being a little bit independent of where exactly in the image that type of feature occurs, you really learn to actually also recognize pictures which otherwise normal other classifiers would already have certain problems. So this is a key message really from deep learning. And as a typical machine learner, you now go back and say, aha, and be a little bit like, critic about this, right? And would, it comes even to points where colleagues of mine said it's a hoax, but you will see when you do it really and use that technology, it, it has interesting new insights. It's not work for everything, right? There are still challenges we will discuss tomorrow morning, but it's an massive uh, advancement in terms of time you use and so forth. So let's look a little bit on it, although lecture two, lecture three after lunch will be then more important and uh, more to the point. You have lots of different kind of application areas where it's already used today, right? Devices, handheld devices, and so they all use this technology. And you even can combine it maybe of using it before you do it with traditional classifiers just to learn the features 
let's say, for instance, also in an unsupervised way with a deep learning network, and then you give it to an SVM, maybe compared or basically combined even with your feature engineer you do manually, right, to augment the classifier. That's what some people do. So it's an interesting property that's not only a classifier, so to speak. This feature learning has much more interesting insights. And we will take that on board when we go to transfer learning in lecture five tomorrow. Largely, it's looking like that. You have different types of layers. You see simply now it's not anymore an artificial neural network, just feed forward, you know, number of neurons. You have different types of layers, right? We will talk about this in the second lecture. But still, the overall idea is you have different signals going through, right? That's your data set. And you have still weights connecting all of these different layers, but the weights are not any more fully connected. You usually have a fully connected only in the latter part here. Right? The latter part is something where um, you basically then come to the classification signal of saying this is really that or that class. This is very similar to a typical neural network with a softmax at the end, <coughs> stating the probability well, that this particular pixel might be to a very highly likelihood this particular class. Again, it's machine learning. There's no complete 100% certainty normally. If you remember from last week, as I said, you should be looking at 100% certainty with very, you know, uh, eyes and really doubtful considerations. Normally, machine learning is not 100% because we learn from data which is noisy. This is a notion we learned last week, right? And in this sense, it could be not really 100%. However, we will see that how we approach now 100% over the day uh, by using convolutional neural networks for our MNIST problem. That's a different story because MNIST is a particularly very simple data set. Now looking on how it is used in practice and how, what the impact maybe is, is best explained perhaps is firstly with ImageNet. Who knows about ImageNet? Right, a couple of them. That's kind of a benchmark of classifying, right? And um, so it has almost 15 million or 40 million images and some of them have even bounding box annotations saying what particular is where in the image. And that's so important. If you go there, I encourage you to just look at it. Even HPC machines are there. Uh, I looked it up. The key message to take away is rather this. When you see the benchmark over the last years was traditional classifiers, where we consider still artificial neural networks and support vector machines and so on, with you know, the error rate of 50% error just 2011. And then you go down, go down, traditional classifiers, ah, 2012, right? So the first deep learning started, Google Lynette, AlexNet, and so on, came onto play. And we see how well, the error rate shrinks. And what you see now that in image recognition, this is by far the way to go. No one uses traditional models anymore in computer vision, right? In order to get this benchmark satisfactory filled. All of them have switched to some certain degree of deep learning finally in 2014. And this is the aha message that you should get. It's a really new approach, of course, admittedly, and needs, of course, computing. Hence, we do a supercomputing tutorial here in terms of getting access to clusters and so on. Because, of course, when you have data like this, and also all the weights needs to be computed, needs to be optimized. This is computing, right? There you need data infrastructures, which have you know, the capacity to work with many, many data sets, samples, but also the processing power to do the optimization that we just discussed uh, with all the different layers. Right, and now it's time for your next practical. So basically, you have a second job script in your directory and a second Python script in order to add a hidden layer, or two actually, right? I would suggest just add two hidden layers. So that would look like this, right? We would have the input from the MNIST data set that we already discussed. We have the output saying the digits. But what you should add now is kind of this construction uh, visually. So how we do it, you see now a, a different script in your home directory that you copied already. and can look, for instance, here on this job description. So this is what you should use, plus, of course, your um, so the job iron and hidden is a job script that you should use together with your kind of reservation. And the aspect we're going to 
look into from terms of Python. We have a different script here, job rm. Right, so this is an, another Python script that we use for these hidden layers. Uh, where is it? It's a different resolution here, so but here is the Python script for that. So if you want, you can go into this. We discuss it a little bit and then we'll submit it. <coughs> but in order of the time, I think the best would be that you submit it right now, right, so that we can dust it properly uh, later on. <coughs> so again, please use QSub with the kind of reservation, as we discussed. But this time, don't use the job INN, but use the job INN hidden, <coughs> right? Which just basically executes now the Python script with the two hidden layers. We're gonna discuss around that. It's just using the time, you know, because it, the classification will take some time um, in order to, to submit now, right? Everybody is doing QSUB with your reservation, job INN hidden. Anyone who has problems with that? So is there, is there a problem somewhere? You don't find the job script. Everybody has done that? Wow, okay. I see we are improving in, in the capabilities. So that's very nicely. Let's go and have a look what it does. Right? And in between, of course, have in mind that QSTAT maybe here and there could be already finished with your job. Right? If you now go to QSTAT, it could be like that the job is queued, of course a hidden one, but as you see, for instance, my normal neural network was already going through. So who of you has finished the job with the neural network already, the INN? If you do QSTAT, you don't see that anymore inside. Excellent. Okay, let's look quickly into some, something like this, because with the hidden layers, we kind of improve, want to improve something. <coughs> and if you look, for instance, in some of the job outputs, you basically should see that there's a, kind of different accuracy. So we have 11, 20, yeah. So essentially it's what we had already on our slides, right? In the end we are just interested in the tail. That is what the slide was saying. And indeed what we got was a test accuracy of 0.92 which is not so bad. If you think about otherwise a human has to sit down and look at 60,000 samples, train from them and then say for you know 10,000, now this is that class, we at least automated the process, right? And with 92%, you know, taking this time as students or so, you may be getting sleepy over time. So it's already a good result that the machine can do this with relatively high accuracy. Still for such a toy data set, it's still very simple. So we're going to improve on that with a hidden layer. So how we add hidden layer? And this reflects actually to one of the questions that we had before, right? Where is now the capability in the hidden layers? They will create more and more of this um, kind of non-linear uh, elements inside the activation functions of the neuron per layer. And this will give us, of course, much more property to capture the non-linearity in the data. Because as we know from last time, linearly separable data with one linear decision boundary is not going to happen in practice. So what we're going to do is rather creating here at, let's say, another dense, which is nothing else than fully connected. So right, we have still the idea of a typical neural network. But this time we use an activation ReLU, which came in, let's say, in the last couple of years, more and more attractive uh, in time and usually people use that very often now, which has the interesting property being, you know, for negative values zero and then uh, you, you go up linearly. Interestingly enough, it helps significantly to accelerate uh, the classification scheme and you will see how, right? So if you now basically have done that, you have used the QSUB, what you did here was nothing else of saying um, the same thing. We have still a softmax classifier at the end with a number of classes. We still have the sequential idea of putting layers, but now we don't have only one input layer and the kind of perceptual idea, we add the hidden layers. Right, and with this, and also having the typical head of um, optimizer that we had the last time and we want to know the accuracy, um, this is now computed again when we have the model fit and we'll do basically all this forward pass and backward pass that we discussed and adjusting the weights according to the optimizer uh, that we discussed as well. 
So from this you see very easy just to add and remove layers, a kind of concept which in Keras is one of the key selling stories compared to TensorFlow, compared to Teano, Cafe. They are all around deep learning frameworks, but with Keras, it's really simple to do modeling, right? You can change the number of hidden units very easily, one parameter, ping. You can just add another layer into the model, model punct add dense activation, and of course later on we will look at deep learning ones, convolutional layers, and stuff like this. So this is something which is interesting. Right, the job script we already discussed, right? There's also no changes here and there. Think about, of course, you should rename it, uh, but the general idea stays the same. We're just calling another Python script. So let's go ahead. And then the output that you should got, uh, should you, uh, that you should get, basically, because it will take some time now to compute while I talk a little bit about GPUs, is basically around 97%. Right, just by adding two hidden layers now. We improve the accuracy and Again, think about in practice, we just improve on here now 5%, but as we have seen in the Netflix example, 5% can mean a lot for a company in terms of revenues. So there are different deep learning infrastructure uh, architectures um, before we move into the GPU world. Just the key message is here really in our course, we mostly do CNN, hence the name of the course, right? Deep learning using convolutional neural networks. At the end, we do shortly LSTMs. Just for you as an indicator, um, they are basically in the realm of these recurrent neural networks. But the majority we will do today and tomorrow is really the ConfNet or the convolutional neural networks. Hence, it is mostly good to use it with images if you go out in the field. Just a couple of things for parallelizing the SGD and the whole process. Usually, there's a parameter server that takes the deltas of the parameters from all the different ones and take them in the kind of dedicated uh, survey to account and then distributing basically this all together again to the parallelization. The parallelization of this in detail will take a whole complete lecture, usually in university, so we omit that here. But if you're interested, of course, here, J J Jeffrey Dean and so on, they have an interesting paper about it, how it works, largely cutting the different domains into smaller and smaller pieces. That's what we want to do indirectly when we use TensorFlow and so forth and, and these deep learning models. Now an interesting aspect is maybe um, this particular one, just as a stimulation for you uh, before lunch also, what deep learning algorithms can do. Everybody knows this AlphaGo challenge? Okay, it was not so many people. So in general this is um, a nice video basically um, where we can look now if our baguettes have already arrived, they're already there, what should we do now lunch or we just basically do a little bit more of GPUs and then do the lunch. So it's a little bit up to, to the others. So let's look. Um, we personally do the video and then we're going to see and make a small poll. It all begins from a single origin, a unique point in space and time. <coughs> this is the spark of innovation that fuels your most amazing breakthroughs. It's a passion for discovery that unveiled the genesis of all that exists in the universe. Today, the power of AI helps computers achieve superhuman capabilities in image recognition and let scientists save our most precious resources by analyzing in one month what used to take 10 years. Everyday devices translate even the most complex languages from voice into text and images into words. Helping the visually impaired recognize an old friend or letting a blind woman read to her child for the first time. Autonomous vehicles give us the freedom to reimagine our city streets. 
and travel where there are no streets at all to help the lost find their way home. We see robots teach themselves to perform simple tasks. We even watch in awe as they take their first steps. And today, a 2,500-year-old game meets its match as a computer competes with one of the greatest human champions of all time and wins. This is the collective imagination. Fueled by forward-looking technologies and the beginning of your most amazing discoveries yet to come. Right, and there we are, right on the scope of the topic. I should mention I'm not paid by NVIDIA, <laughs> although you have seen a video which was, I hope, a little bit impressive. And also if you look into the internal of companies, they don't tell anything, they don't publish anything, but where they use deep learning, it's quite amazing. It's really adopted in, in practice, and you have just seen some of the insights from it. So in order to check the login to some GPUs, it's better to proceed now with the second part. I know lunch is coming up, uh, but as the majority of you know already GPUs that I got from the call, we do this a little bit quicker, right? In the end, the, the real exact knowledge how a GPU works is also not necessarily a requirement for those of you who are more in statistics, more in machine learning. Just take away the message that I have here on a couple of the slides. It's nicely parallelizable. It's a very important um, concept these days, and basically uh, GPUs are there um, and everywhere more energy efficient. And hence, you have seen the video NVIDIA. I have to say that in the moment, NVIDIA is also by far the market driver in terms of GPUs. So what is a GPU? And to start, what a GPU is, you probably want to ask what's not a GPU in terms of multi-cores. Right? So many of you probably know the term multi-core, right? Everybody has a laptop with multi-core. Okay, has someone a laptop with single core? Okay, no, not really. Right, so multi-core was already a phenomenon, basically driven by the fact that our CPU clock speed could not be increased, so it's getting too hot, essentially. Right, and with getting a CPU too hot means lots of bit errors, and with this the idea was getting more and more cores that are, let's say, uh, on one chip together, in order to, to fix different problems that we have that otherwise would be done by a CPU that was always increasing over the last like, like 10, 15 years. So this is the idea of multi-core processors, right? Something you already know, which are very powerful, right? Hence, they're, very, they're getting also very hot and mostly take also advantage of lots of lots of cache. You put them on one ship and have different cache hierarchies. These are very important because usually that's where also lots of speed is hidden for us in the data area. So lots of um, limits we have actually in terms of data processing are perhaps better set in, in this area, like caches. You cannot increase the caches significantly because they are the most costly effective part. I mean, this is where the cost is inside the chips and so on. Including more and more cache would just make them more expensive. Hence, there were ideas of other approaches also. And this brings us more to the domain uh, basically of the many core GPUs. So we have lots of problems in the world where maybe the computing is not necessarily the driving factor. So we can parallelize a problem very much, bringing it to nicely parallelizable, and do lots of lots of processes, up to the hundreds and even thousands, on basically one of these GPU devices. So you would have still a host CPU, as we call it, very close to the GPU, which has the typical main memory that you know but basically what you put alongside it is an accelerator, as we call it, in this particular form a GPU, as an example, which has some device memory. Hence, usually what you do is you have to put from the file system and everything, everything to the, here, the, to the aspects of the CPU, to bring it then from the main memory to the device memory. This is usually a very costly step in terms of time, right? So this is the only bottleneck that you maybe have in the moment, uh, plus maybe also less cache. And of course, the device memory is limited. Otherwise, we could maybe solve many big data problems in the world today. Um, but of course, the device memory is not capable of getting terabytes 
or let's say petabytes, this is still what you have on file systems close to the host CPU. However, the interesting thing is that there are many, many, many cores and their, their power is not as much as in the multi-core, right? Which means they are moderately, <coughs> you know, computing. They're not the cutting edge in terms of CPU power of saying that's what we put in the multi-core processes, but there are very many of them, many cores that are just moderately working on problems. Where could that be useful? Now, if you think about that, you know, each of those cores, let's say an example with 128 cores, <coughs> you can even have different threads. That's what the multi-core CPU is doing, so we can do the same thing on the many core. So when we have eight threads that are all moderately working, we have already 1,000 workers doing something, right? And when we have a problem which is beautiful to be paralyzed, this is just nice. The more workers we have, basically, we can scale better. And one example application that you, for instance, have is matrix multiplications, matrix vector multiplication is shown here. We will do an exercise together, what that means in, in the next slide. So when you think about how that will work, um, what, what are here the benefits, if you now think about the simple example of uh, matrix vector multiplication? Anyone, just to get you a little bit active also here in the theoretical ideas. Yeah, please. You can do all the operations in parallel. Right. Basically, if you think about, that is one good aspect, um, this one and this one, the color coding that you see is basically the only thing, if you know a little bit about math, that matters for one GPU core, maybe, for instance. All other things are irrelevant. What does it mean if it's irrelevant, maybe, from uh, one from you? If it's irrelevant, that you don't need to know the data of the others. Now, communication, right? You don't really need communication between the processors. If you have lots of physical problems, like weather forecasts, you have lots of interactions between the cores, exchanging the physical parameters on one tile, moving on to the next, in weather prediction, in large computational simulations. You need very good internet connectivity between the cores. Here, it's kind of data parallel, as we would say. You have a matrix, and of course, it would be in our machine learning examples, convolutional neural networks, many, many, many big matrices. We do with weights multiplied by our signals. And this is, of course, something where you think about now when you can cut off this always so beautifully and nicely, we can really leverage this 1,000 threads <coughs> that we have significantly with very much many and big matrices and vectors. So it's not only independence in terms of um, the other data, it's also you absolutely don't need any requirement of talking to the others. No communication over it, you put it somewhere in the device memory, the result, and of course then the host me memory should extract it from there to report the result of that, but you just ship it off, so to speak, as we say, to the accelerator, please do this matrix multiplication, and after that, when you've done it, I use it for my report. So this is the kind of concept um, how that works. Here's just an example of a CUDA core and the bigger <coughs> GPU from NVIDIA. Again, I'm not paid by NVIDIA, but as I said, um, it's basically the market driver. Hence, we also use NVIDIA GPUs today. And usually how they look like is basically here. They have lots and lots of these cores, not the very strong ones, right? Take into account these are not the really full multi-core, full-blown production ones. Still many, many, many of them. You have still some <coughs> registers, how CPUs works, but it goes a little bit beyond what we do here. A key aspect, of course, is then always <coughs> the memory units that you have uh, for your GPU, the device memory. And yeah, this is expected to grow more and more cores on the, on the NVIDIA GPUs. CUDA is a way how you basically um, kind of program the NVIDIA GPU with a specific language, um, how you do it, uh, which is very proprietary. Right? It's called uh, a unified device architecture, basically, um, and it's a specific way how you program it. There's also an open source version, which is not yet so successful. It's still working on, of course, a little bit always behind NVIDIA. So let us a little bit think about GPUs, where the name comes from, just for the terminology, right? It's derived from graphics processing units. And who is knowing NVIDIA maybe from games? Game playing or so, usually my students all hands up, right? I have a nice game which is using capabilities of my NVIDIA card. 
However, here in HPC, we use a bit a different card with double precision, so a bit more sophisticated ones, but the key idea is the same, right? And I just want to go quickly through it. You know that already. The most of you know what a GPU is. So you, the same aspect that you would have um, with a CPU device and then the host that always goes along, you know that from your graphic card in games. However, for games, you have a very specific pipeline that you always do when you do, for instance, I know, ego shooters and what's sexy in the moment. Um, you always have different, you know, kind of aspects which are related to creating better graphics for your next iteration in the game, whatever it might be, right? Could be anything. And this is then put on the GPU and it works just perfectly well because it has this one kind of pipeline. And that's how also we think about it. Now, if you think and compare it to the matrix multiplication, it's in a way nothing else. It's a clear pipeline how that should be done. There's a mathematical law really precising of saying the matrix vector multiplication should always be that way. So you can easily get a kernel, which is a little bit alluding to this, how that pipeline should be programmed when you do matrix vector multiplication. And then we talk about streams of data when you think about more and more data is in. And in a way, what you will do is basically from poor graphics that you know from your gaming, from the NVIDIA cards, um, you now think about a more programmable pipeline for general problems. Hence, the official name of a GPU is still um, basically graphics processing unit, but these days it is a GP GPU, meaning general processing. <coughs> Right? And this is an important aspect. So you go away from the geometry, from the rasterization, all of this, which you basically done only in graphics, <coughs> but keep the idea of pipelines, streamings, nicely parallelizable aspects, like you know, data-driven computing that we have seen in the matrix vector multiplication. Just the difference um, now for multicore, just to have a benchmark, what it really means, right? When you have now some benchmark here um, in terms of peak gigaflops per second, that's the kind of indicator how fast it really is. And basically you see over the years how that kind of um, inter CPUs really kind of, they cannot be really getting faster, but here on the GPU, the fine light slow threads, you can always improve. There's no heat problem, right? You cannot have, let's say, um, the, the problem there because you can put more and more on it because they're not so, so fast, they generate not so much heat, and with it, uh, we don't have this bit problem issue. And with this, it's an aggressive performance grow that goes up and up and up with the GPUs these days. So more and more, um, basically, are included of the cores inside these ones. Um, from the programming model, just also to mention it, because you know, it's, it's of course a drive to do standardization in this area. In the moment, CUDA is by far the way how to program is a GPU these days. Just that you know there's OpenCL as well. That one can use here and there, although it misses some important functionality. Hence also the most um, kind of uh, yeah, machine learning algorithms and frameworks, they use CUDA DNN or the CUDA um, kind of library, which is particularly well suited, of course, for NVIDIA GPUs. So it's a very hard topic to go away let's say, from this um, manufacturer. And just to comparison, in, in simulation science, there was a similar idea with MPI. <coughs> it took like 10 years this will got a standard. So when we look now on GPUs and OpenCL, it will probably take another five to 10 years until this really gets into a standard that everybody is using this as accelerators. So in a sense, um, with the SCUDA, um, it's basically kind of a subset of C, if you want, how to program it. But here in the course, we don't care about it. As I said, there's a particular library we will touch on in lecture two, uh, making the point when it came out, um, which we will use in machine learning. But in the theory aspect, which is nice for all problems, and you think about big data, scaling more and more to bigger matrices, to more data to be digested with bigger models, maybe uh, it's like unlimited scalability. Of course, this has different limits we have to discuss from the machine learning point of view as well. But uh, it's, of course, an interesting technology to look at in the next years. Just for you as comparison, um, this is the one you typically know from gaming, right? GeForce. Who knows GeForce? The majority, yes, exactly. What the people don't know typically is that in engineering and design, they use a different version, the Quadro. And then also in high-performance computing, we usually have a NVIDIA Tesla, which means there's more accuracy. Right, and it's not really comparable like a game, what we do. We do scientific breakthroughs, 
um, at least we aim to, and also we basically have lots of concrete <coughs> position. In this sense, it's not should only look nice, it should be nice, right, in the numbers. That's why, of course, the precision, and usually also they are, of course, much more costly. And there's constant evolution and innovation. You see, uh, there's now just NVIDIA Tesla everywhere, um, that now people are already having Fermi, and um, Kepler is then again already the innovation of NVIDIA Fermi, so it goes on and goes on and goes on. And the GPUs that we're going to use here in Leuven, unfortunately, are also a little bit older, so it will also take longer as, in, for instance, in the new PAP100 or so that exist on the market. So meaning for you, wherever you go in which center you compute, think about that it matters when the CPU came, uh, when the GPU is basically um, was manufactured and which type it is. It fundamentally tells you a bit of story about speed, right? So the older the GPU, um, the speed would be definitively less, and it could clash with TensorFlow, Teano, with other implementations because also the backwards compatibility, unfortunately, is not so brilliant, let's put it this way. However, now you know about the GPU. Just shortly, a problem we see in the centers is that many people occupy the <coughs> GPU while the CPU stays silent. Not a nice way um, how it should be, and of course, in future, this means largely that the utilization of the center goes down, right? A supercomputing center like Jülich and like everywhere else, 99% uh, always used, right? Utilization 99%. Now, with having GPUs in the game, we need the whole CPU, but only a couple of times, and the most of the time, the CPU is not doing nothing and waiting. It's not a desirable property in the moment uh, that we face. It is not good for the statistics, and there's an idea of also doing this a little bit in terms of hybrid some work is there around, or some of have the idea with the many integrated core architecture of, um, uh, of Intel to also partly run directly as a host CPU. You see, there's a constant innovation going on, and now there's actually news that even the MIG architecture will be stopped, and, and, we, and, and AMD is working together with Intel to create accelerators. So if you look a little bit in the media, it's a very much active topic these days. Just at the end, before we go to lunch, some applications, usually very much image-oriented, especially traditionally. You see here our brain that we basically cut in 700 slices, very thin. It's a real brain, post-mortem, actually. And then when you do this, you need a certain registration process so they fit together to each other, right? So that it's really 3D reproducible. And for these kind of options, you have the same aspect of saying, you know, compute the angle and so on. This could be beautifully used with a GPU. And one example why we have also an NVIDIA application lab in Jülich. Again, we're not paid from it, just saying we do lots of research in this area. However, the impact in other areas I quickly want to show uh, with a typical, if you want, pipeline, which was in the past of saying, um, like medicine, right? You have a drug design, you kind of have uh, two kind of ingredients of a drug, let's put it a bit abstractly right now. Um, you put them together and you see if they're docking, if they can hold together, right, this is the ingredients, but that's not the core of the process. The question is if they can hold together over time. So you simulate basically this over time with a kind of tool called Ember or Charm, which also take the energy field into account. It could be that even if they dock at some point, basically they, they draw each other apart from each other based on an energy field. <coughs> so this is more a simulation sciences aspect, but by now all of these packages, Ember and others, are engaging in GPGPUs. They all have now a more or less a team working on it. And if you look now on job descriptions, even MATLAB, traditional machine learning packages looking for GPU developers and so forth in order to accelerate their packages. What we're going to use today and what we now have to try out if we have access to would be the KU Leuven GPUs. And again, a warning here again, five, you see there, five GPUs only for a course uh, as many as 40 roughly, I guess. So this could be a little bit of a bottleneck. So if you use the GPUs, please use them wisely, otherwise you block the others in scheduling. Hence, follow my directions on the screen uh, step by step. For the CPU part in Ghent, you can still experiment around with the neural network, add layers, do different things. That's reserved for today. There's enough cores. If you don't overdo it, you can play around with these. But with the GPUs, be a little bit more, um, let's say, uh, kind of moderate, because we want to want to do bigger things, right? Bigger interesting data, not only MNIST. So hence, 
We use and we get. Yeah. yeah. There's only five K14 nodes. We'll yeah. also use the K20. Ah, so okay. We have 13. Ah, good news. Good news. Yeah, I thought yesterday they were too, too not fast enough. For the big one, we need the K40s. Yeah. Okay. And for a smaller one, we can use K20. Right. So the there are also some older ones. Hence, you see already the speed impact I just described. Right. The older the CPU, unfortunately, they are not so quick. And when you have the large problems, you will see it. It has an impact on each of the epoch. Basically, we train a convolutional <coughs> network and so forth. So, but still. Um, Use them with care, and here's a K40 that we use majorly. There's a couple of K20, which are <coughs> probably here around. And this is here on fire that is another architecture that I just described in terms of accelerators. But here are the CUDA cores that Kenneth just met. Right, so it's not so hopeless in terms of number of GPUs, but um, also take away the message that we job, do the jobs at the end of the day and come back tomorrow morning to look at it. Right, so we have all night of having your GPU jobs processed, uh, and this should be working out. So important for you is now that you can do this thing. You're, in, you're logged in into Ghent, right? You module swap cluster golem by default, but now if you use GPUs, we always have to go to Leuven, and please, everybody should try out this command without your user ID. It should work like that. Now, and if it doesn't work, scream or, you know, raise your hand. Right, just this command, login, SSH, login, HPC, Kaolin, or B. Maybe try that yourself and... Yes, yeah. I will make a demo of it. You should be seeing it. Yeah. But for the people that don't know, you can use your PSC accounts in Leuven, in Brussels, in Antwerp as well. You shouldn't need to use a password, but you have to do it from the Ugandan login notes. Not from your local laptop. So make sure you do this from the Ugandan login notes. So you log in like you do normally in Ghent, and then you just do another SSH to log into the. So you'll use your BSC account and. You can also log in directly if you want to, but then you maybe have to change footy and all these things, so it's easier to do the whole thing. So, you should see a welcome message like this that you're now in Leuven and not anymore basically in the system here in Ghent, right? It will only work from the account in Ghent. Because otherwise you have to specify, of course, your security credentials. So if there's someone who is not seeing this login, please raise your hand. If you cannot log in, that's the point why we do it before lunch. Right? So that we know that because we have to fix it then over lunch for you. After lunch we will try and start using the GPUs then. Again, a poll, everybody has access, right? So there's no one who has no access to the GPUs. Okay, going once, twice, okay, good. That's really the key message I wanted to leave here on the table for you with GPUs. I don't want to mean to make a big lecture about it, just perhaps the two kind of um, frameworks we used. They, of course, as GPU and CPU support. So Keras, for instance, where I said it's a higher level deep learning library in neural networks, will under the hood use TensorFlow. But TensorFlow also has CPU and GPU support, uh, whereby we took take a message for many of the machine learning tasks. Actually, the majority, would, I would say, the GPU is much more faster. You can execute on CPUs. And actually, one of the selling aspects of TensorFlow compared to Cafe, compared to Tiano, compared to all other CNTK is largely this one. It can very beautifully run in a distributed fashion, right? Tiano is just optimized for one node really and so on and they're extending and so on. But TensorFlow has this from the design, so to speak, already inherent that you can use CPUs together as GPUs and so forth. As you see here, like a hybrid or CPUs on different workers. So if you go off, here in the tutorial, we're not really going to do that. We use two GPUs to make it simple. But if you go off in basically after the tutorial, do your own um, work with TensorFlow, take this into account. And this is then transparently used in Keras when you specify 
the, the backend Keras, uh, the backend TensorFlow in Keras. Right, at the end, just basically um, a video here for you as a stimulator for GPUs, where it is everywhere used. <laughs> and we will continue after lunch then basically with your runs and also with lecture two, which has much more about deep learning and convolutional networks. High performance computing. When you need to speed up your number crunching application by a factor of 100 or more, high performance computing is unbeatable. If the application, even when it deals with heavy numeric computation, takes too long for results, it's balanced in your workflow. You will avoid using the products at all, or worse, for reducing properly, that costs. Catalyst implements high performance computing based on a CPU GPU system. GPUs, graphics processing units, and many core systems providing a highly parallel design. Traffic from many scientific simulations, for example in the field of physics, chemistry, astrophysics, medicine, financial application, or earth observation. GPU-based systems even start to conquer ordinary business applications. In heavy numeric computations, a GPU processing unit, also called stream processor, is about 3 to 10 times lower compared to a CPU kernel. But there are so many of them that you can achieve incredible speedups. Nowadays, GPUs have several hundreds of these stream processors. We at Catalyst have the algorithmic know-how to use this enormous highly parallel potential for your heavy numeric calculations. Beside the enormous speedup, many core systems are leading in energy efficiency as well as cost efficiency. Your initial investment is about 20% lower for a CPU GPU system than for a comparable CPU based system. Even energy costs for operation decrease by a factor of 10. Due to more slow, hybrid CPU GPU based systems can give a performance increase of about 1,000 times within one decade due to energy and cost efficient scalability. <coughs> a future oriented technology if you keep in mind that CPU-based systems have a performance increase of about 100 fold within one decade. This table shows that the growth of GPU performance is likely to do so till 2017. Today, a NVIDIA GeForce GTX 580 reaches theoretical peak performance of one teraflop in a second for a price of 400 euros. Extrapolated from today's values, you will get 11 teraflop for 400 euros in 2014. But what if you need 10 teraflop or more today? The answer is quite simple. We use multiple GPUs in one server or in the cloud. That is a scalable anticipatory solution that we adjust to your needs and requirements. To sum it up, your pros building on a GPU-GPU based system are incredible. You can tackle much bigger problems than you are currently thinking. You can choose better algorithms to solve the problems that are faster, more accurate, or that are giving you more detail. Your initial investment is lower compared to a CPU-based system. With a GPU-CPU-based system, you are building on a scalable, forward-looking technology <coughs> that saves you energy costs as well. We at Catalyst have experience in setting up the multiple GPU system using its advantage in our software products. You get a full range of IT solutions. With our knowledge, we are able to speed up your calculations. Imagine, instead of waiting hours for your results, it could only take you a few minutes or even seconds. We were already able to increase the performance of our customer's risk management tool by a factor of 400. Instead of waiting hours to receive the latest risk analysis results, they now get their results in a couple of minutes. We also have projects in the field of real-time image processing in our portfolio built on a GPU. We unleash the power of GPU computing in the field of non-destructive analysis and imaging of inner structures of materials, which is used for quality control or in the development of new materials. 28 pictures with a dimension ranging from 2048 to 1000 up to 8,192 to 1,000 are processed per second, including sophisticated
sophisticated algorithms like a fast Fourier transformation, which is implemented in software. We are Catalyst. Software is our passion. I'm also not paid by catalysts, I should say, right? But here and there, the videos are nice because they also show you the impact to remote sensing, what we do after lunch. Lunch is served and we continue basically at one o'clock. Thank you very much. <laughs>